basically uh, settled there. And then what the surgeon does is that they articulate the joint just to make sure uh, that it stays in place. Um, and of course, they, <coughs> they become quite enthusiastic toward the end, as you can see. Uh, but gladly, the patient is uh, still anesthetized. Okay. Uh, let me show you, in fact, um, uh, another video, but this time uh, done, in fact, more cleverly about uh, using, in fact, arthroscopy. So, in this case, you can see here, again, the damaged uh, cartilage. You can see here the fissures in the cartilage, and then uh, this surgeon, again, in Italy, they basically uh, clean that, uh, right, that area, reach to the subcondral bone. You can see here they are not using bleeding, um, which is interesting. And then they come again with that seeded biomaterial, hyograph C with chondrocytes, and then locate it there and just put it, because they shape the whole uh, defect to that uh, biomaterial. I mean, they articulate, and then you can see now uh, the advantage of this second generation compared to LCI. So once he put that biomaterial, what happens then is that it falls with this articulation. But because the cells are retained on, on the biomaterial, um, then there's no problem. They do something that I can even do, and they just come back and just put it in place. So this is really effective and really easy to do, in fact, uh, for the people who work in this area. Right. And then uh, one year later, then uh, this is the first look after 12 months. So you can see here the new tissue, and you can see here that hyalograph C seems to, in fact, support the growth of, of the chondrocytes and make them lay good. Uh, matrix, and that was part of a clinical trial where we wanted to look at the tissue, the quality of that tissue. So, unfortunately, for these patients, uh, we, the Italian surgeon managed to convince them, uh, nicely or not, that they have to basically take that uh, biopsy. And this is where they send it to our lab, where we can look at the quality of that tissue. So they just enjoyed it for 12 months. Right. So that's what we can do. But we what we can do is in fact uh, treat this patient, which is basically a patient suffering from advanced osteoarthritis. And what you can see here is that if you look at uh, the, uh, the upper end of his knee, the, the pinning condyle here, you will find that in fact the area of the damage tends to be unconfined, meaning that it lost its periphery. And that's, you know, if you look at the femoral head, you know, here, uh, that applies to the same. So uh, treating uh, these, uh, the, this kind of lesions is, in fact, more challenging. Keeping in mind that, in fact, the osteoarthritic joint is quite hostile environment where it, 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 it's known to secrete a lot of cytokines that um, stimulate degradation of carbon. Um, you can add to this another layer of, in fact, uh, debate, and that's basically the, the chondrocytes of, uh, uh, and that alluded to the fact that even stem cells from the elder may have a problem. And I'll, I'll talk about this now. Uh, but look at the chondrocytes. So uh, chondrocytes taken from aging people tend to senesce, meaning that um, they lose, they lose the, the length of their telomere and therefore become dysfunctional. But they have as well reduced proliferative ac activity. Um, uh, and that's not good if you want to expand them extensively in order to put them on scaffolds and use them in the treatment suggested. So these cells are diseased, uh, they have longer proliferation time, limited ability to redifferentiate or specialize again, and, uh, lay down type 2 collagen and what you'd like hands. They are of limited supply because, as we've just seen, uh, even in fact the remaining cartilage might be even damaged and diseased, so it might be useful. And there is this issue of patient-to-patient -patient variability in uh, cell function. Uh, so that's really what invited us to think uh, here in Bristol um, back in 2002, 2003. Um, uh, and uh, basically, that basically drove us to think about using stem cells. So at that time, the field of stem cells was still early and in its infancy. I still think it is, in fact. Um, and what we decided to do is look at the potential of stem cells, uh, adult stem cells, as an alternative source for uh, recreating uh, cartilage. And so that's what we focused on. Uh, so stem cells, as, uh, as you know now, uh, they can be extracted from uh, different uh, levels of our development, reaching the blastocyst where you can get 30 potent stem cells, and these will give you embryonic stem cells. 
all the fetus and adult cells that will give you multipotent cells and we call them other stem cells. And some people prefer to call them somatic stem cells as opposed to embryonic. Um, so when we talk about uh, mesembryo stem cells, um, the most accessible, uh, in fact, um, adult stem cell seems to be the one that resides in the bone marrow. And uh, these cells facilitate bone repair and remodeling, and they have this in vitro um, uh, multipotential where they can form all kinds of tissues related to uh, the surrounding, uh, basically, organ. So in this case, they are residing in the bone, therefore they can make bone cells, they can make fat cells, they can make cartilage, they can even make muscle cells. Uh, and people think that they support hematopoiesis, and some people, there are in fact old reports suggest that they can even uh, become brain cells or astrocytes in this case. Um, but what, what, what's interesting to us is in fact was to focus on their ability to go through the sequence of uh, uh, maturation from being uh, uh, early MSCs to um, uh, mature chondrocytes. And, and again, the problem here is that uh, when scientists began working with, the, with these cells and tried to coax them into becoming chondrocytes, what they found is that they just go all, all along and reaching this stage of what's called hypertrophic chondrocytes, which is a terminally differentiated chondrocytes that leads to calcification. So it's basically the precursor to bone. Um, and uh, the best a scientist can do was uh, basically to uh, pellet these cells so that to induce chondrogenesis um, from uh, mesenchymal stem cells, what you need is to condense these cells into a pellet in the, in the lab, just like this. They are very tiny, they are hairpin sized um, um, pellets, and then add a growth factor called tumor growth factor beta, TGF beta. Uh, and that seems to make these cells uh, lay down matrix uh, rich in type 2 collagen and protein glycan. But now that you've seen how what we need really to repair a, a, a lesion in the, in the joint, you would guess that really that tiny small size basically won't work. The other issue was that when people worked with these cells, they argued that they have in fact limited potential. So they are in fact, if you take them from elderly people, they seem to have limited capacity to regenerate. So we asked ourselves, well, is it possible in fact to overcome the cell? Can we engineer fully blown cartilage using these cells? And, and we went on, in fact, to go about this. And what we um, uh, thought that we can do is that we should try to optimize every signal, um, uh, single step in the process of making cartilage, uh, where we um, uh, basically look after the best signals we can provide for perforation and the best signals that we can provide for uh, differentiation. Uh, and our simple technique, in fact, for uh, driving the differentiation of these cells is based on isolating these cells from the bone marrow, expanding them on plastic, and then seeding them onto a biomaterial where they can be sitting on this rotating platform for up to 35 days. And at the end of 35 days, you can get this nice white shiny tissue there sitting there, and that can be taken further for analysis. So, um, as I said, uh, what's special about this is that uh, we, we are able to generate, in fact, up to five millimeter, and to show you something else now, just special for this audience, is that we, up till 19, um, up till 2010, um, we were able to generate these five millimeter, this um, uh, uh, sized diameter um, uh, engineered cartilage from mesenchymal stem cells, and that's thanks to looking after the most important things. So we used fibroblast uh, growth factor two when we expand these cells. And it's been reported that this growth factor, for example, when you add it to mesenchymal stem cells, it enriches for a subpopulation of chondrogenic stem cells. You add then, the, we treat the biomaterial with fibronectin, which is a, a, it's a natural adhesion molecule that seems to meet, make these cells stick and aggregate. So we are encouraging, encouraging them to condense on the biomaterial. Um, and then we add DGF beta, and we've learned from our background in cartilage catabolism that, in fact, if you use ascorbic and insulin, you will basically push these cells at later stage to lay down even more matrix. And that's how we can, in fact, engineer cartilage from uh, osteoarthritic uh, patients. 
So here's a comparison between the best we can get using nasal chondrocytes. They are, in fact, another source for making hyaline cartilage, just like articular cartilage. And we use this as our golden standard. And we, when we compare that to the cartilage that we generate using uh, mesenchymal stem cells from osteoarthritis patients, uh, we found, in fact, they match them. And in fact, in some cases, in fact, they are better than uh, what we get with uh, mature nasal chondrocytes. Um, but I'm happy to break the news that, in fact, now we have managed to scale up uh, this tissue engineering and we can reach, in fact, uh, two by two centimeter sized um, uh, implant that, in fact, uh, that can be rated for treating large defects. And, and, uh, and this is another challenge. So making sure that you can engineer cartilage that's that large will basically pave the way for treating hopefully the unconfined lesions and large lesions that's found in advanced osteoarthritis. Um, moreover, um, through work funded by PACS uh, and in collaboration with uh, the uh, Center of Excellence Genomic Medicine with Dr. Gary and Dr. Ashraf, uh, we um, managed basically to uh, win a grant where in fact we are looking at a sub the subpopulation that seems to be responded to FGF2. And it, what we did here is that uh, there is a nucleolar marker found around 2006 uh, called nucleostamin, and this uh, nucleolar protein seems to traffic uh, between the nucleus and nucleoplasm in, in, in proliferating cells. And what we've demonstrated here uh, is that you can see the expression of uh, nucleostamin in undifferentiated cells, but once you differentiate the MSCs down the chondrogenic or osteogenic or atypogenic pathway, they lose the expression. So it is a marker of proliferating stem cells. So what uh, this cuts from the project in, 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 uh, in Sigma will do is basically uh, try to uh, nail down and extract these cells from the bone marrow. Uh, and nucleostamin is implicated, in fact, it's a marker of uh, neuronal stem cells, and it's a marker, in fact, in cancer. It's, it's thought to be one of those shared pathways with cancer cells. So there is, in fact, multiple edges to this study, and the idea here is to clone the promoter, which is not yet cloned, for that uh, gene, and then design a promoter reporter uh, transfection system, uh, maybe viral, where we can infect the bone marrow stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, and select for these cells. And hopefully, uh, we can then characterize these cells for surface markers and, and, and see if they are probably the, the ideal subset for treatments. Um, but we're not stopping there. Um, um, we want as well to look at these cells. Um, and why this is important? Um, well, I think it's important because if you are to deal with um, um, cell-based therapies, while in fact we should always aim to use autologous cells, I'm afraid that in terms of commercialization, that may not be possible, at least so far. It's very, very costly to expand uh, with confidence, with competence, um, and with efficacy uh, the autologous mesenchymal stem cells of a patient. And therefore, it is important to look for something off the shelf that's ready, uh, typically allogeneic. Um, and, and that allogeneic source then can be uh, used for different patients. And that basically you know, gives this a comparison between pluripotent stem cells, which can come from embryonic stem cells, or uh, as Dr. Dan pointed, from induced pluripotent stem cells. And these cells can divide indefinitely. They are scalable. They can be autologous, um, although I argued against that now. And they can be allogeneic. Um, 